Okay, and we are back with part two of Meet at Gettysburg with the esteemed author, historian, Kent Masterson Brown. On part one, we basically took Meet in the Army of the Potomac through July 1st. And I think with part two, we're going to pick up on July 2nd and talk about the fighting and, oh, a few controversies that might ensue on the uh, second day at Gettysburg. Kent, welcome back. Thank you. Great to be here. Okay, well, so we, you touched on in part one about concerns about the uh, Union flank, the left flank specifically being vulnerable. Uh, do we maybe want to pick up the story on the uh, morning of July 2nd, 1863? What is Meade's thought process at this point as he brings the army together and continues to concentrate him at Gettysburg? Uh, <clears throat> well, for a, an operational commander, uh, like George Meade, his, his duty and his role continues as uh, the one who is searching for information about the whereabouts of his enemy. And um, uh, even the enemy he knows is on the field, uh, A.P. Hill's Corps, um, uh, uh, Richard Ewell's Corps, doesn't know much about where Longstreet is, um, but he knows those other two corps are on the field. But now it now we're looking at a at a tactical uh, matter. Um, he has he sets up signal stations all along the um, cemetery ridge at the headquarters of uh, Henry Slocum uh, on the of the twelfth corps on Little Round Top. Uh, there's a signal station not far from Meade's headquarters. Uh, these are, you know, they the denude trees of branches and set up signal stations in trees. They set them on top of buildings, uh, whatever. And of course, the one on Little Round Top is so is so high that um, uh, it commands a view of the entire battlefield. That's going to be uh, uh, important through the next two days. But um, <clears throat> what Meade is trying to discern now is what is this, what is the tactical thing that this enemy is going to embark upon? And I mentioned this because I, I, I was fascinated uh, just reading signal uh, station notes in the official records. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a constant dis uh, 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 a message that seems to be coming through principally from Little Round Top. Uh, some from Cemetery Hill, where there's another signal station. Uh, that there are large numbers of troops moving from the Confederate right to the left, meaning moving to Meade's right. Uh, some of these sightings are of significance. Large numbers of troops followed by ambulances. Uh, moving along the Her Ridge Road, for instance, uh, uh, off the west of Gettysburg. And um, one has to, uh, uh, you can imagine George Meade trying to assess this. Is, is Lee moving everything to my right wing in order to attack it? Or is this a ruse? I dare say, it's a ruse. Large numbers of these sightings are Meade or, or Lee simply trying to get Meade to concentrate on his right when Lee wants to attack his left. Um, but nevertheless, as the operational commander, Meade's got to make a decision about that. Um, and he can't afford to miss this one. <laughs> I... um, and um, so he does have grave concerns about his right flank. Happily for him, in the morning of July 2nd, the 5th Corps arrives. And uh, he gets to place the 5th Corps along the Baltimore Pike uh, behind uh, Slocum's 12th Corps. Um, he knows the 6th Corps is still en route, but it's not going to be there until like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's when Cedric told Meade's messenger he'd be there. And by God, he does get there. You got to hand it to Cedric. He's a guy who works on the clock. 
and he and he gets there in time. But so Meade is gratified with the arrival of the Fifth Corps, and um, uh, he's got plenty of people over there on the right flank. He probably thinks the problem now is his left. And um, what does he have? Well, from Cemetery Hill, where the remnants of the First and Eleventh Corps are, moving to the left uh, down. Uh, Cemetery Ridge uh, comes the Second Corps, which finally is put in place after bivouacking behind the Little Round Top the night before. They're brought into line along Cemetery Ridge. And then um, uh, Dan Sickles, <laughs> whose corps is basically has camped overnight out in the fields in front of Cemetery Ridge. Um, uh, uh, and along Cemetery Ridge is directed to form to the left of Hancock, the second corps. And um, then perhaps a, addressing the elephant in the room, so to speak, or in this particular room right now, would be a corps commander that perhaps Meade was not as gratified with, Dan Sickles. And, and, and I think, so we have some, I think we use a lot of the same source material I did in my Sickles work and you did in, in the Mead book, but sometimes we come to different interpretations, which I think is part of the, the challenge with the so-called Mead Sickles controversy. Um, you want to pick it up, go back to the morning of July 2nd. It's about 8 a.m., 9 a.m. in the morning. General Mead comes out of headquarters. He takes his son, Captain George Mead. This is a scene I've recreated on the battlefield hundreds of times. But you want to tell the story as General Meade tells Captain Meade to go seek out General Sickles? Yeah, well, he, he, he does just that. He meets him out in front of the Leicester house, uh, uh, tells him to ride down there um, and um, basically see what's going on. I mean, he, Meade, has, Meade has given now the instructions. And Meade has even had uh, Captain Payne draw a map for each corps commander of where they're supposed to be. And um, uh, Reynolds, I mean, uh, uh, Sickles has even gotten um, a message from uh, 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 the, uh, the corps commander who is occupying uh, uh, General Geary on Little Round Top, inviting him to send a staff officer to him so he could show him where he should be placed. Mm -hmm on the northern face of Little Round Top. And so, um, you know, stop the, stop the camera right here. Meade, in my estimation at this moment, has given Sickles plenty of instruction. Yeah. Including a map. Uh, so he, and you're right, I mean, I, I, there's, a, um, there's a trust problem that exists between the two. Yeah, and you're right. And that was that was one of the things I've always said. If you really want to understand this, you have to go backwards to at least 1862, I think, and understand the trust and the communication problems that no doubt exist between Meade and Sickles. You can't just parachute onto Cemetery Ridge on the morning of July 2nd and say, geez, how did how yeah. did this communication breakdown happen? Um, you know, you mentioned the pain map. I would argue that copies of the pain map that I've seen today, uh, and there's some debate over whether the ones that exist today are, are of the correct provenance or not. Uh, some of the, the copies of the pain map that exist tend to have sickles stretching out towards the Emmitsburg Road. So I think that is hard to use. But what I always talk about first is Meade's verbal orders. And I always go back to Meade's testimony before the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, where he described the orders, because they're verbal, and unfortunately, we don't have any written ones to refer to. But where Meade talks about the orders, he, he basically says, um, you know, I intimated that Sickles was to occupy the position that I understood General Hancock had put General Geary on the night previous. Sickles replied that Geary had no position. Uh, he then said to me that he was in the neighborhood of where he, the Corps, and said to me that there was in the neighborhood of where his Corps was some very good ground for artillery. And this comes in later when they, when they meet at headquarters. But, you know, as Meade describes his orders, he's basically saying, uh, extend the left of the 2nd Corps, replace Geary, 
occupy that range of hills. And according to Meade's description of the orders, Meade adds, if practicable, to occupy it. And there's been some heat on social media over this uh, because you you referenced me on page 219. I, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm no, sorry no, I, I said in his fine book. Okay. Exactly. I, and I, <laughs> I, I should like add I misspoke. It's page 218. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have Alan Gelzo here today. I mean, imagine. No, you, know, of- you know, honestly, and I should clarify for listeners. I mean, Kent Masterson Brown and I know each other. I mean, we're not. We're not close friends. I don't like come down to Kentucky and, you know, ride the horses with you, but we've, we've been together in the past and had some very uh, pleasant interactions. So likewise, when I first read that past passage, you know, James Hessler in his very fine book, Sickles at Gettysburg, I I just kind of said, Oh, well, that was nice. And, and obviously then from there, you were a little hard on Sickles and you say, look, in your opinion, it defies credibility that Sickles could have been confused over the order. Um, I wrote my particular passage about 11 years ago, and the point that I've always made isn't so much a case of whether or not the Meade-Sickles orders are clear. The point that I've always made is Sickles has given enough warning signs that they're not clear to him or that he doesn't like them. You can accuse him of outright disobedience. He's either unclear or he's being disobedient. But where I said in the past, I think Meade, does should get dinged a little bit is if you have a difficult subordinate who's repeatedly telling you, Hey, I don't like what I'm supposed to do here. It would have served me in hindsight to come down there and inspect the position earlier. And and I stand by that line. Uh, And I've had a lot of people on the battlefield agree with me on that line, but, um, but in your opinion, and you know, this is your show today as you're the guest. Uh, I think in your opinion, you feel like Sickles is really more guilty of just outright disobedience. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I honestly do. Um, I think he was given <clears throat> plenty of um, uh, instruction orally. Um, you're to form to the left of Hancock um, and um, occupy the northern face of Little Round Top. Um, he was given a map. Uh, I don't know anything about really the provenance of the maps I've seen that are attributed to Payne. Uh, but I do know Payne, draft, he was a topographical engineer, mm-hmm. drafted those maps uh, in accordance with what Meade's wishes were, or orders were. And um, I have to assume, um, without respect to what we're seeing popping up here and there, that um, those orders were, those maps were explicit. Uh, But in any event, even later in the morning, Sickles appears at the Leicester house Mm -hmm. and Meade points to Little Round Top and tells him, I want you there. Um, I I don't know how much more one, an an operational commander, and imagine all the stuff that this guy's dealing with. Mm -hmm. Right. Not the sickles. Uh, in in the army, um, they would take a very a a a, 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 a court martial would take a very dim view, I think, of sickles' um, position in this. Yeah, and obviously, most subsequent historians take a dim view in that as well. So you know, there's no doubt there. You know, but- it, it, and, and, and even, even if he had questions, um, I, I understand anyone who has questions, you know, about things this, this critical, um, but those should have been ex- clearly voiced to the commander himself. Um, but if questions are one thing, you can't expect the operational commander to have to come out there and make sure each corps commander is doing precisely what he told them to do. Yeah, I know. There's got to be this sense of confidence. The minute you tell Henry Slocum, I want you here, Henry Slocum is there. Right. Um, and if there's any sort of problem, that guy's got to go. That, that commander's got to go. Yeah. And, and, um, and you know, and, and I wouldn't disagree with any of that. Um, although I would add, whether or not the commanding general has time to leave headquarters and do that, that's what he has a staff for. 
Um, right. you know, that's, right. that's, that's an option. And again, I think in Sickles' case, he's, I'm not absolving him of any blame for what happens. In fact, I open that passage with while Sickles bears the ultimate responsibility. And I've still had some people follow up with me and say, how can you say he has no responsibility? I'm like, go back and read the sentence, please. But again, I think, you know, Meade's, Meade's been signaled several times. So when three o'clock comes around and Meade and his supporters were later right, we had no idea Sickles was out of position. I'm like, come on, guys, I'm not buying that. I think that's, I think that's some CYA after the fact. Uh, and that's really my only position. And I don't want to harp on this, but I get what I get what you and others have said to the effect of, well, the commanding general can't go around and personally make sure every corps commander is obeying orders. But I think in Sickles' position, there's been an, in his case, there's been enough warning signs, um, you know, to kind of say, hey, let's make sure we get down there and get it right. And that was really all I'm implying or saying when I blame, when I do, you know, blame Meade for any of it. Um, Having my, my law career of 46, 47 years represented an awful lot of people who are as guilty as hell. And I know how tough it is to defend them. No, it really is. <laughs> well, now you do it. But you just got to suck it up sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, but let's, talk about, but let's talk about history as interpretation, you know, because as I said before, you know, First of all, I've always said, if Sickles is hell-bent on being the cowboy who's just going to go off and do whatever the hell he wants, yeah. why does he willingly come to headquarters at 11 a.m. and say, hey, guys, I could use some help. I could use some yeah. assistance. Yeah, he does. He does. He, he and does. He, you know, he, and again, I've, and I say that because I've seen interpreters on the battlefield here who basically say, oh, Sickles told me to go to hell. I don't think so. Now, where I think Sickles is given too much wiggle room, uh, you know, again, Meade says, I, you interpret this as saying Meade pointed to that hill and said, put your troops on that summit. I take Meade's description of it and say Meade says, quote, if practicable to occupy it, which as we know that phrase is at the heart of every Civil War controversy. Um, but beyond that, Unfortunately, I think for Sickles and Meade, as Sickles is leaving headquarters, he says to the effect of, you know, do I have any liberty with this? And Meade says, within the general confines of what I've told you, how you execute it is up to you. And again, I'm not placing any blame on Meade for that. But I think, unfortunately, as a New York lawyer and politician, and frankly, just because he's Dan Sickles, I do think in his mind that probably gives Sickles what he feels is some justifiable wiggle room to, to execute it as he sees fit. And look, we know what the final results are. We know how history has judged Sickles. Uh, I just think it's a more nuanced story than more historians have portrayed it as. And that's really where I, I try to go. I mean, that. I appreciate that. That's probably as grand a defense of Sickles as I've ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, I feel, I feel like this is a great defense of Sickles. Um, I feel like this is inherent the wind or something. I'm up before the jury or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. is tough to defend a guy who's guilty as hell. Now it just is. But hey, uh, hey, uh, be the first time Sickles got off while being guilty as hell. So. That's right. right. <laughs> but uh, but um, I too, I think it's it's a personality issue as well, and I think that's one of the things. It's it's always hard to quantify that as a historian because we like facts. We like this yeah. says this and that. Yeah, Nichols is not a trained military man. Yeah, no, no, and that's a, there's a key there. That's a big key. That's a huge, huge thing here. Yeah, and I think so the way that maybe a Slocum or a Hancock or maybe a Reynolds might have interpreted orders given to them by the commanding general. Sickles may not necessarily do that. And, and I think one of the things that we've talked about before is that while Sickles has this kind of reputation of just being kind of, he does what he wants when he wants, he's also a guy that requires a lot of handholding. Mm -hmm. And Hooker did that for him in a lot of situations. And so when he's not getting that, he's not only in kind of a foreign environment professionally, He's also in a foreign environment interpersonally with how things are going. It's a different situation than it was just three days ago for him. And I think that matters. So it's not absolving sickles, but I think that has to be considered. And I think sometimes in a leadership role, you're only as good as the weakest part of your organization. 
And I think for me, if you have these concerns about Sickles and you were this worried about him, I might have maybe spent a little more time just making sure he's he's singing from the same hymnal we are. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I appreciate that very mm -hmm. much. I guess that's uh, that's as good a defense as one could ever pose for for for, for Sickles. Oh. Can I get that notarized? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the wall. Um, so. That but so, nevertheless, 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 in in terms of the army, um, my position would always be that's just simply not good enough. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, uh, he he was given plenty of of explicit orders orally as well as in in paper, and. Um, uh, even to the point where he comes to headquarters, and I have to hand it to him doing that. I agree with you, James. I, I, I you know, here he is. He shows up, but there's Meade pointing directly to where he wants him to be. And um, and then when you fast forward, and Meade's convening a conference of his generals, yeah, and he gets word that Sickles is on the move. You know approaching the Emmitsburg Road. And I mean, well, you can just imagine. Uh, you speak of a crisis. Um, uh, how many of these crises, <laughs> we could uh, really, it, the, I guess the subtitle of the book should be, uh, you know, the, the 15 crises facing me from June 28 to, 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 ju to July 14. Um, because it's one after another, and this could be the biggest of all of them. Yeah, why, well, why don't we talk about that? And before we go on, uh, again, just to reiterate for the listeners, on page 218, Kent Masterson Brown did refer to Sickles at Gettysburg as a fine book. And I'm okay to let the matter rest there. Um, by the way, folks, I meant it. It's a good book. <laughs> okay, but you know, you bring up a great segue. So whether we agree or disagree on how Sickles interpreted or could have, should have, would have, uh, with the orders, now we have the crisis of the moment. It's the afternoon of July 2nd. Shells are starting to fly. Meade finds out his left flank is not where he thinks it's going to be. How does George Meade, the new commander, react to all of this? With anger. I mean, really, some people claim they never saw him as angry. Um, he, uh, he, he has to use a borrowed horse. Um, uh, rides out toward where Sickles is moving his troops and runs into uh, Sickles comes up to him and there's that great exchange where Meade tells him pointing back towards Cemetery Ridge that is where I told you to be. Um, Sickles tries to apologize for this I'm sorry I didn't do uh, shall I move back and, Mick, and Meade says yeah, it's probably too late you know, I mean, the, the artillery is already being fired. And um, um, ultimately, he says, well, you know, maybe that's the only thing you can do. But it also, Meade also at the moment recognizes, you know, obviously Little Round Top's bear of troops. Um, and so this is what prompts he to send Warren and his uh, staff officers over toward Little Round Top to try to sec make sure it's secure. Um, and this begins uh, George Meade transferring from the operational commander of the Army of the Potomac to the tactical commander um, of the Army for all practical purposes on July 2nd. And um, he literally, he uh, frankly, when he leaves the conference, knowing that Sickles has made that move, he turns to George Sykes and tells him to move your fifth corps up here now. Right. Right there, even before he sees what this looks like, mm -hmm. he tells he tells Sykes to move the fifth corps. So uh, me then move goes over toward where the the uh, the, the fifth corps should. Uh, come off the Tannytown Road and the Blacksmith Shop Road and onto the Wheatfield Road. We know it's a Wheatfield Road. And there is where Meade situates himself for this almost this entire uh, story uh, on the afternoon of July 2nd. Uh, and and here's, here's, here's the operational commander of the Army uh, literally sending into the Wheatfield area alone 
four different divisions um, of his army, from the Fifth Corps, from the Second Corps, to try to bolster that the defense of that position. And I, I had to, I, I, I considered a lot in, uh, about how to address uh, Meade's uh, uh, tactical decisions on July 2nd. I found him, his, the situation interesting from a whole lot of perspectives. One, uh, George Meade, um, there's no way he could send reinforcements out to the Emmitsburg Road. I mean, he knew those positions were gonna collapse. There's no way those units would hold on the Emmitsburg Road, given the situation. Um, and uh, if you send reinforcements, they're gonna collapse with the rest of them. And <clears throat> the other thing is you can't use any field artillery. I mean, if you, if you take the artillery reserve along Cemetery Ridge, uh, they can't fire in that direction. They're gonna hit their own men. So there's almost no options left here other than to do one thing, and that is to find a position where he can strike uh, that could at least slow the attack, that might be able to break the attack up in the, the, the area of the wheat field. How many times of the day do you guys go out to the wheat field? <laughs> it it depends area. how big the bus is. <laughs> <laughs> that area of the wheat field just had to have just he looked at it and he says we're going to do it there i can manage that because the he can throw as much as he can in that wheat field and he can continue to reinforce it because they're still close enough to the lines along cemetery ridge that can be uh, where other troops can be brought forward so what he does, he sends everything he can into that one spot of Bernie's lines, General Bernie's lines, in an effort to just break the attack up. Um, you see this in uh, sport too. I mean, you see it in football, where the you know the object is to just go in and smash some element of those of those blockers knock them out so you can get to the guy who's running with the ball and it not different here in that if if you can br make a breakthrough there then we'll we'll deal with the flanks next we'll just deal with it and that's all the choice the man has in this and so four divisions go in there. And Meade is literally right behind where he's sending them the whole time. Uh, he occasionally will move up to the northern face of Little Round Top. He'll then go back and situate himself along the Wheatfield Road. And from there, he sees every one of those divisions of the Fifth Corps, plus the, uh, the uh, First Division of the Second Corps, all go into that wheat field. I mean, I always say it's certainly a contrast if you want to compare it to how Robert E. Lee is managing his army this afternoon. I mean, Meade is right in the thick of it and, you know, as hands-on as you would expect the army commander to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, and, and I think I say in the book, never has the Army of the Potomac seen an operational commander uh, do this, ever. Uh, actually be the one down there tactically bringing each unit into the fight. Um, it's, it's, it's stunning in many ways when you consider their history of the 26 months before Gettysburg. And it does the trick. I mean, it ultimately does the trick. And as, as, as the, the fighting, the, the Confederate attacks literally wear out in mm -hmm. the week. They just, ammunition and exhaustion. They finally wear out, and, and he can see where that has stabilized. And as, as the attacks move up the Emmitsburg Road toward uh, Cemetery Ridge, Meade moves up himself with his entourage. And um, <clears throat> all the way until the evening when he's literally at the angle on Cemetery Ridge, uh, watching the, uh, the, the last attacks along those lines. 
from right behind where those Second Corps troops are positioned. And um, I, there's it just there literally was there's never there never was a commander of the Army of the Potomac who had done anything close to that. And you can see now how the, as, a, as an operational man, how different Meade is from all of his predecessors. You and, mentioned you mentioned the flanks. Um, how about the stripping of troops off of Culp's Hill? And uh, I, it's a great, great, of course, great question. But you speak of a you speak of a of a gambler. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you speak of a gambler. Uh, I, I, as I put in the book, uh, to tell the audience, in order to get some of his troops over toward the left flank, he's stripping them out of Henry Sloak, not only taking the Fifth Corps away from the Baltimore Pike, but he's now stripping elements out of out of uh, uh, Slocum's 12th Corps, all but one brigade. And um, uh, Slocum pled with him to at least leave me with a division. He goes, no, you can keep one brigade. And everything else goes to the left. And the, and the, 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 the problem Meade was facing was if he can't win on the left, and it's dicey, if he can't win on the left, then he can't win. That's just it. And you, and you, you, he, he, he's going to look at one crisis at a time as they arise. And this is the big one. And um, he's going to address it. And so we'll do whatever we t ever it takes. But here you have the Baltimore Pike now totally, almost totally exposed. Right. Thank God for darkness. Darkness helped. Uh, and Pop Green helped. And his, his defense of Culp's Hill that night, uh, totally heroic uh, defense of Culp's Hill. Um, and, um, but uh, uh, some of this, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a little luck in it. Uh, Meade, uh, I think, would probably agree that he was lucky that night, that it was Green who was left behind because <laughs> he put up one hell of a defense. And, but he was aided by others from Cemetery Hill and some from the western face of Culp's Hill, the First Corps troops. But um, uh, nevertheless, he had stripped everything else out of the, uh, of the right flank. And um, uh, yet in the end, as darkness fell, um, I love that quote of Meade's as, as uh, the first corps and some eleventh corps coming on the battlefield to plug in the last uh, gaps in that poor defense line that's now battling uh, Ambrose Ransom Wright's Georgia brigade that's coming across the field. Meade hears some soldiers grumbling in the ranks, and he turns around and to the to, to everybody's hearing, he, literally around him, he says, "Yeah, but it's all right now. It's all right." Now, uh, can you imagine uh, after a day like that hearing that? Even if you were a, a close staff officer of Meads or close to Meads, I mean, had to be the most welcome thing ever. Because mm -hmm. that 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 day was was uh, that's a he literally that's a battle he, he he by all rights should have lost. That attack of, of Longstreet's was so ferocious so big, uh, uh, had such energy behind it that by all rights, Meade should have lost that, but he didn't. And, um, and in much measure due to his uh, persistence and um, of keep sending them in until we, we beat them down, wear them down. To me, it, it often, when I think of Meade on July 2nd, I often think of Robert E. Lee at Antietam. Oh yeah, really? A very comparable a situation point. where operationally we'll we'll look at the big picture later, but it's the mm -hmm. commanding uh, commander basically putting his men where they need to be at the time, not at really both. worrying. At we'll get to the next crisis later. Well, yeah, we'll and work on that that next. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, that is that is Robert E. Lee at Antietam. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a great comparison. And ironically, Eric usually says Sharpsburg, but for some yeah, reason you he said Antietam today. So I'll just point uh, yeah. that out. <laughs> are, you, are you a Southern boy? <laughs> uh, born and bred, North Carolina. Oh, okay. That's right. You're from North Carolina. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Wow. 
Antietam was the battlefield of first impression for me. The first battlefield I ever gazed on. I was five years old. And um, I had a family, still do, who live in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, my grandmother, uncle, and cousins all live there. And we, we would go, we take the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad to Washington from here and then get on the B&O. We go right out that line through Fred, through Monocacy Junction to Harper's Ferry. And I remember coming into Harper's Ferry, the conductor, I was in the dining car and the conductor came to me and said, uh, young fella, have you ever heard of John Brown? And uh, I, I in retrospect, I should have said, that. yeah, he's a cousin of mine, but no, <laughs> but no, he says, you ever heard of John Brown? And I go, uh, no. And he tries to tell me how he raided the, the Harper's Ferry raid and so forth. And he says, and you know, it was one of the causes of the Civil War. And I kind of went, you know, oh, really? Well, we got off the train in Martinsburg, which is just the next stop. And uh, my aunt met me and uh, we put our duds away in the house and she turned to me and says, would you like to go to Antietam? Mm. I said, what's that? She said, it's a battlefield from the Civil War. Well, this is twice I've heard this today. And we went to Antietam and I'll tell you, as I've told her many times, um, it became a terminal disease. I mean, I just, uh, it's, it's, it, I got stung. And so, Year after year, we go back to Martinsburg. We visit there all the time because of my grandmother. And um, off to Antietam. <laughs> I love the place. I love the place. But, but no, it's right. It's exactly what Lee did there. Uh, he just he became a tactical commander. And he put one unit in after another uh, and, and left the decision making regarding other areas of the battlefield to whenever we address this one. And I've often wondered with Meade, he always seems to be acting at times, I don't mean this in, in a bad way, he's acting more like a corps commander on yeah. July 2nd than he is really an army commander at times. Yeah. But yeah. what has he been up to that point? Yeah, he's five days ago. He's a corps commander. Yeah, just five yeah. days ago. He was a so corps commander. Not, you know, that's, I think there's a tendency for all of us to kind of revert to what we know. Yeah. And I think in that situation, as everything is breaking apart and it's chaotic, Meade can fall back on what he knows and yeah. whatever people think of Meade as an army commander very rarely do people criticize him as a corps commander yeah a yeah. very good corps commander and I think so he kind of is playing to his strengths a little bit partly I think maybe subconsciously but also he has no other choice no he has no other choice no other choice and again he has to address one crisis at a time mm -hmm. and yep. uh, the big one was on the left and I I was interested I found that uh, an article written by John Gibbon in the American Historical Review. Um, I was published in the 1880s, I think. I can't remember, it's in the book. But he's the one who raises the, the question about the use of field artillery. And he says, there's no way we could use our field artillery. And we either, because we'll hit our own men out there on the Emmitsburg Road. So we can't, they're, they're all silent. So what do you do? Um, well, me came up with the with that alternative, it's, and that's the reason for the bloody wheat field. Okay. Yeah. I uh, tell you, it's definitely a unique interpretation on the second day that you've got, and so obviously, I think the um, the book is going to open a lot of eyes and a lot of dialogue to that to that notion. Mm -hmm. um, before we get off the second day, though, I want to make sure we cover the evening, and I'm going to make air quotes here: the Council of War. Uh, I don't know now in our in our touchy feely pro mead environment, are we allowed to still call it a council of war or is it a consultation? It's a consultation. No, I'm no, okay. exactly, I'm, exactly. Is it a consultation? By the way, by the way, people said you know he didn't read Jomini. The word consultation for those is a Jomini term. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the when I referred to it in the book, I said uh, uh, he ref. Uh, Mead, Mead regarded him as consultations and in right. parentheses is a, a term out of on war, uh, the art of war by Jomini. Um, they were close readers of those theorists and yeah. uh, had been for years. Now you mentioned but, John Gibbon, who was a friend of Mead's. Contemporaries yeah. like Gibbon did still call it a council of war. And I, you know, I say that 
I, I, from a semantics I, point I of view, I don't know if I care, but you know, I don't. I mean, no, I'm being funny. Don't yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about that because it's it's another seminal moment in sort of you know the 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 indoctrination of Meade to command of the Army of the Potomac. Sure. Uh, now sure. there is there is a message that Meade basically um, sends that depending on what source you read is either eight o'clock or at eleven o'clock, and I know you have a definitive take on this. Mm -hmm. uh, where at least by around eight o'clock, Meade seems to be saying, "I've decided to stay," mm -hmm. uh, and then he goes ahead and calls together this consultation with his core commanders. You want to just talk about that? Yeah, and, and uh, yeah I'll be talking about the letter first. Um, the, the, the date I use on that letter is eight o'clock. Right. And the reason for that is that's what the official records say. And uh, right. um, I'm a, the, the lawyer in me tells me you use the document. The, the best evidence is the document written at the time. Uh, and uh, whatever that document says represents the best evidence. And uh, that says eight o'clock, and I, you can't escape that. Uh, the reason the letter is not sent down the Baltimore Pike is the Baltimore Pike shut down. I mean, they're fighting on the Baltimore Pike. Mm -hmm. um, and um, <clears throat> so that thing is not gonna get through anywhere. Uh, Meade holds that letter until around 11 o'clock when he sends it down to hand to the couriers on the Baltimore Pike when that has quieted. And the letter is then sent down. So, in 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 in, in some respects, the the, the 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 evidence we have from, um, I think, as young George says, it it was sent at eleven. Right. Exactly. Uh, is correct, uh, because the council of war then ends, but it was written at eight, and um, uh, Meade calls a council of war. <clears throat> uh, can't send the letter because the Council of War, and among the things there they address, and by the way, there are many things they address, um, uh, not just staying in Gettysburg or not, um, uh, but all of them uh, agree that uh, you should, they should, the army should stay. Um, it's interesting, uh, Jomini says Councils of War are useful, particularly when all the commanders agree with the operational command. They're all in unison. And it's interesting, before this council, Meade already wrote a letter to Halleck saying he's going to stay. Mm -hmm. I have to know that is Meade's intent, period. Uh, before the Council of War on July 4, Meade wrote two letters, one to Darius Couch and one to General Smith, telling him he's going to pursue Lee on Lee's flank. Mm -hmm. Emmitsburg to Middletown. That's before the Council of War. So in both instances, Meade will make his decision about it, uh, and but then not tell any of those commanders. He will let them make decisions, and then we they go from there. And in each instance, all the commanders were in agreement with what Meade had already written. And in the case of the, the Council of War on July 2nd, uh, they all agreed to stay. Um, uh, there were other things discussed. Um, <clears throat> you can imagine the disorder in the Army of the Potomac when that Council of War was called. And by the way, for all the criticism poor Meade has gotten for calling Councils of War, um, Councils of War in the modern army are, you know, that's the way it's done. I mean, you know, you, you want every core commander to know what every other core commander is doing, where his troops are, what their condition is, right. all that stuff. And every bit of that stuff has to be communicated to the operational commander too, because he's the one who's got to make sure these guys get what they need, they're positioned where they need to be, uh, and I mean, it's like it's like a football team not having a huddle ever. You go to a huddle so you know exactly what everybody's supposed to do the next time the ball snapped. And in, in the modern army, 
It's a team game. And me now is a team player. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. He is a team player par excellence. And um, his idea is to get that team together, get uh, all the information out. They can get on all kinds of things, including food and forage. Um, uh, uh, General Williams makes an incredible comment, really, in a letter to his one of the, to his daughters about the conference conversation uh, uh, going on to the f what's what's left of the f of the of the army with respect to its food and its forage and he says <clears throat> we haven't eaten none of us have eaten i mean in days and he says the and, and all the railheads are out we can't get anything in here and then he then he says um uh in terms of the horses this army will will wind up having no transportation unless something is done to feed the animals. Um, so there's you can see that being laid out on the on the deck. Um, but the the ultimate upshot of all this is that uh, the army, the, all the corps commanders agreed with what Meade had written at eight o'clock, and that was we're going to stay. Yeah, and I think I'm glad you mentioned the condition of the Army, because going back to that eight o'clock message, there's a passage that I think people often omit. You know, he says, I shall remain in my present position tomorrow, and people often stop there. Mm -hmm. But it actually goes on comma, but I'm not prepared to say until better advised of the condition of the Army, whether my operations will be of an offensive or defensive character. And I think you hit on it. The meeting is still important to determine the condition of the army. And what better way to do that than to call everybody together? Right. And, and also to, to determine for everybody's sake where all the elements mm -hmm. of all those corps are. They've been shuffled everywhere that day. Right. Imagine the, the fifth corps. Uh, imagine Sykes, uh, what he has to report. I would have loved to have heard him. Um, uh, Sedgwick whose core gets split up as the, as once he gets there, it's late in the afternoon, but nevertheless, he's got them moving, you know, down the Tanny Town Road too, to the round tops and, um, but they're scattered everywhere. And um, it's to try to bring some understanding of where this army is before we take the next step. And of course, uh, what's really interesting is that Meade begins to, uh, as a result of that conference and after that conference, begins to bolster the center of the army uh, with whatever he can call up to bolster the center of the army. This is the second corps, anticipating an attack against the center um, uh, the next day, which of course happens. Yeah, which of course is a great segue into July 3rd. Um, before we go to July 3rd, I did want to mention, I think it's page 279. I thought you had a great passage about how Meade has outrun his supplies. And this is going to come back then after July 3rd and the retreat and that sort of thing. The aspect of this that we often don't think about that the losing army, the Army of Northern Virginia, is actually in a lot of ways at this point better supplied than the than the victor is. Yeah, I, I try. There's a there's a a paragraph, I forgot the chapter now, maybe it's in the, um, the over July 4, but I try to draw a comparison between the state of those two armies uh, on, on July 4. Uh, and um, I mentioned um, uh, the, what, what I uncovered writing the retreat from Gettysburg. And that is Meade's, Lee's army came on the field far more deliberately than Meade's. Um, and when Lee's army came on the battlefield, there was a, uh, a system to it, to where when troops were drawn up in line where they would launch attacks, two to three miles behind those lines, they would set up hospitals. And you can go to them all today. I mean, uh, 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 most of them are still standing. And then around those hospitals would be all the quartermaster stores, wagons, and all the subsistence wagons, and all the, all the, the, the livestock on, on the hoof, cattle, sheep, whatever else they're going to eat. And now, so Lee's army 
um, has its hospitals set up with, with, with uh, ambulance depots, by the way, so that stretcher bearers can take the wounded to depots and then the, the ambulances would just run between the depot and the hospital. So it's, a, it's an incredibly a systematic system. And um, uh, here we are on July 3rd. Uh, Meade's army hasn't been fed. Its animals haven't been fed. Um, you don't feed a horse for three days, you're going to lose the horse. You don't feed a mule for three days, you're going to lose the mule. Um, and that means... You know, those horses under the army regs require 14 pounds of oats and 14 pounds of hay a day. Now he's got 60,000 horses and mules, me does. Imagine the job of feeding 60,000 horses and mules, almost impossible. But in this circumstance, they have none, nothing. On the other side, Lee's army, uh, they brought all their subsistence stores right to those hospitals, right behind the lines. They have all their quartermaster stores right behind the lines. So that uh, the army, even though it's fed meagerly, they're still fed. And the horses and mules are fed. So here you are, the, the contrast is stunning, really, mm -hmm. the irony of this. Here's Lee's invading army that has been defeated, and it is in better shape even though it's had lots of losses now, I and mean, lots of losses, and losses in officers that they can ill afford to lose, but so they've had, they've, they've suffered a lot. But nevertheless, in terms of that army's mobility, it is far more capable of movement than Meese. And um, I, you find that, a lot of people find that almost impossible to believe. Yeah. But yet that's the fact. That's the fact. Um, but back to July 3rd, um, uh, Meade has you know, planned for an attack against the center. We all know that great quote with John Gibbon after the Council of War is over. And Meade uh, tells him that he believes the attack is going to uh, be at uh, the center of the line. And that's you're commanding the second division of the second corps, which is the very, the very place that is probably going to hit. Uh, some people have discounted that quote. Uh, I don't. I don't disbelieve John Gibbon. I think it's he's telling you exactly what he recalls, and um, and uh, it, it also sounds like George Meade. I mean, um, and um, of course that's what happens. And um, I love that uh, scene of Meade riding down Cemetery Ridge on July third, and going up the western slope of of Little Round Top to where the 146 Pennsylvania uh, monument is and looking out and he can see the uh, uh, 146 New York. Uh, he can see all the guns being lined up out in the fields in front of Seminary Ridge. Mm -hmm. And um, he knows right there what's gonna happen. This is gonna be a, they're gonna try to, to bombard these our lines as heavily as they can and then attack it. You can just tell. Yeah, and you know, the Confederate cannonade is often, I think, inaccurately portrayed as being ineffective. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked on this show before and among friends about the heavy casualties that are in fact suffered in and around the high watermark area. But one of the unintended consequences of the cannonade is the overshots are going to start landing in at Army headquarters. <laughs> and it's going to put George Meade out of contact for a while as he and the staff kind of figure out what to do next. You want to just tell us a little yeah, bit about he, that story? The shelling gets so intense that um, he basically has to leave the Leicester House. Uh, Leicester House is being hit and um, uh, some shells come within, you know, feet of, of George Meade. Uh, they move to a barn across the uh, Tannytown Road and that's worse. I mean, uh, uh, Dan Butterfield is wounded by shrapnel inside that barn. So, ah, they, poor Butterfield. <laughs> is that worse? Well, he's your buddy's friend now. Come on. He is, <laughs> our, he is our buddy's friend. That's right. He is. Uh, and then, um, um, then, the, then he goes down to uh, the tw 12th Corps uh, on the Baltimore Pike uh, the, um, and tries to uh, occupy that. And finally, he, he winds up literally. Um, uh, a tented thing 
um, south of, um, of Slocum's headquarters. And then is re re he, he, he orders his staff to go back as, he, as he's listening to the sound of all that gunfire. And um, he finally gets back to Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, um, uh, as the attack is ending. And he's literally riding in, in and among uh, the mobs of prisoners of war that are being hustled to the rear, Confederate prisoners of war. And he finally gets to the front lines. And of course, the smoke is dense. There's still some gunfire. And he asks people, have they turned? <laughs> have they turned? And the, the young officer was hearing this and saying, he was mighty cross. And I can imagine, I, mean, I would be cross too. I mean, think, <laughs> think about that. I mean, being knocked out from one headquarters to the next, all the way back to nowhere, nowhereville, and then have to crawl your way back and um, and finally the attack is over. But Yeah, uh, the, the irony of the fact that because of that, George Meade kind of misses Pickett's charge. It's he, kind of an ironic he moment. View any of it. Yeah. None of it. Um, uh, but he got his share of the bombardment. And... Um, but, you know, he being the operational commander, you got to keep him safe. You, you can't expose him. And, and um, so they did what was right. Uh, but sadly, and to his anger, he missed the show. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, I wish I, I, I had, I had there, there was something out there uh, that we, one could find that uh, where there were some more interviews with George Meade at the moment, um, what we, what's in the book is all that's there. And most of them are letters written, many, some of them after the war, recalling uh, Meade coming up to the front lines. But um, uh, you really do yearn for some words of his uh, said to somebody uh, close to him about his feelings at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, here he has finally repulsed the enemy. Uh, it's a victory. There's no question now about it. Um, and um, uh, uh, a signal moment in Meade's life, for sure. Ironically, he's cross at that moment. He's cross. He's he's really ticked off. I mean, I, I missed the whole show. <laughs> I don't care about their flags. Have they turned? Yeah. <laughs> I love that story though about uh, uh, three of his officers uh, on the east side of the Leicester House uh, hiding uh, hiding to, to to escape the shell fire. And Mead Mead is, is really kind of a uh, uh, a tough nut. He he he. Although he's conscious of the shells, I can't say he's not. Uh, nevertheless, he walks over to these guys and chastises them. Mm -hmm. Or why are you hiding behind the house? You know, well, you know, try to get out of the shell fire. And he says, "Oh, it reminds me of that wagon driver that I remember in uh, at Palo Alto uh, under uh, Zachary Taylor." And um, he turned his wagon over and was hiding behind it as the shells were coming in. And uh, Zachary Taylor asked him, what are you doing behind there? And he says, well, I, I'm trying to get out of the way of the shell. Don't you know that you're just as exposed there as you are anywhere else? And he goes, yeah, but it kind of feels better. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can, I can, I can, uh, I can identify with, with that. I mean, uh, uh, anything would feel better than just being out there, but not for me. To me, me was tough. Me was tough. Well, we've gone probably over the time that you graciously agreed to commit with us today um, as we've gotten through July 3rd, and we've touched on the retreat a little bit, but I think the retreat deserves its own segment. Would you be gracious enough to come back and talk to us again, where maybe we focus specifically on Mead on the retreat and Mead at Williamsport. Of course I would. Okay. Of course I would. And see, folks, I for anybody, company. I mean, <laughs> for anybody, for anybody who thinks there's any heat between us because of Mead and Sickles, we're all friends. <laughs> so by the way, David, I'd like to. If do, do you like to speak? 
around the country about Dan Sickles. Oh, do I like to speak about sickles? <laughs> How many hours do we have left? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I speak to roundtables and Zooms and all Would kinds of things. Would you like to speak to the Kentucky Civil War Roundtable in January? Uh, we could talk about that. I often don't travel during the dead of winter because of weather conditions. Do, is there maybe a more tropical time available in Kentucky <laughs> that we can talk about? That's the only date open. Oh, okay. Well, well maybe we'll talk about that offline. Yeah, yeah. We, let's talk about it. All right. Um, maybe as we kind of then wrap up this segment, kind of a part, any parting thoughts on your part, Mead at Gettysburg. Um, how do you want people to remember George Mead as commanding general of the Army of the Potomac, specifically at Gettysburg? And we'll, we'll do other things at other time. Well, uh, um, as a, um, as a commander who, um, um, uh, once he took the reins of command, uh, moved uh, that army uh, decisively uh, into a position that um, uh, uh, I, I think anyone who looks at what Meade had in mind for the Pipe Creek line, the defense line there, uh, was a, um, <clears throat> a, a spectacular position to take and how he used every effort he could to bring the enemy to him there. Uh, and, and it's important here too to say this, that the Pipe Creek line is not a, what a lot of people say is an offensive defensive thing. It was a defensive line for Meade and that's what he wanted to happen. That's what he, planned all the operations on July 1-4 were to direct the enemy to him at Pipe Creek. That's his plan, period. And um, how it ultimately was foiled by the disaster of the 1st and 11th Corps uh, on the first day and their withdrawal retreat to cemetery and Culp's Hills and his in turn movement of the rest of the army <clears throat> through the afternoon of July 1 and into the evening and frankly all the way to the next day uh, to positions at Gettysburg from really distant towns where the 5th Corps was in Hanover, the, the 6th Corps was in Manchester. But how they, he directed all of them to Gettysburg. And um, he's just, if that's where we're gonna fight the battle, then this Meade is the type who says, then I'll by God fight it there. And um, uh, on the next day, after setting up all his defenses um, at, at Gettysburg, uh, he was attacked on his left flank after Dan Sickles moved his third corps forward to the Emmitsburg Road and, and to the uh, line between the uh, Peach Orchard and, and um, the foot of Little Round Top and um, uh, how Meade, him as a, even though he was the operational commander of the army, took over tactical control of the battlefield on the left flank and literally himself directed each one of four different divisions into the wheat field alone during that afternoon. Um, and then once he managed to stabilize that situation, the crisis of all crises, he then continued to tacti tactically command all the operations all the way up to the center of his lines, uh, what we call the angle. And when the fighting ends on July 2nd, uh, Meade um, is there at the angle having directed the last divisions into that attack into the, the defense of Cemetery Ridge. Um, uh, this is a commander who is a team guy, a team player. His calling of the Council of War on the night of July 2nd was absolutely fundamental uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the ability of that army to continue to uh, uh, function. Uh, in that it, uh, it gave the, uh, an opportunity for all the Corps commanders to discuss with the commander of the Army the situation of their Corps. They had been scattered 
all over that battlefield on July 2nd, addressing crises at one end and the other. Um, and um, the, the, the army uh, had lots to talk about in terms of its, its situation with respect to food and forage, which they did. Um, these kinds of councils of war are fundamental to, uh, to the survival of an army. And uh, everyone has to be apprised of what everyone else knows, where his, where his commands are situated, and the condition of those commands. And among the things they talked about were casualties and how many men are left. How many do we have left? Mm -hmm. Well, we started with 91,000. We got 56,000 now. I mean, this is the price of July 2nd mm -hmm. so, and July 1. So, um, uh, and then, of course, that, that led... Um, uh, in the midst of that, everyone knew who was there at the center of the line to receive any attack that might come there. Uh, and of course, it was met and defeated and um, the, uh, the enemy attack on July 3rd. Um, I, 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 I personally um, I can't conceive of a commander who did more personally in the defense of his positions uh, for this army than George Meade did on July 2nd. And um, it's um, uh, stunning to me, really. You don't see an operational commander do that. Great. <clears throat> and obviously the story will continue beyond July 3rd. And, and we definitely look forward to having you on to talk more uh, Meade matter. Maybe you can sort of become our regular contributing Meade correspondent going forward. Whenever we need a matter of Meade, we'll, we'll call on you. Sure, Jim. I, yeah, I, I enjoy you guys. And um, <laughs> it would be great fun. I mean, whatever. You just tell me. Yeah. Okay. Well, be careful what you wish for. We'll be in touch. <laughs> I didn't say I wished it. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> no, I'd be delighted. It'd be, it'd be fun. I enjoy talking with you guys. Thanks, and definitely same here. Eric, any closing thoughts? No, I think a really great insight into Meade. I think certainly he has seen a renaissance, if you will. I've been recently calling him the Union Longstreet uh, as far as kind of the rehabilitation of his character and people, I think, kind of rediscovering him in some respects. So I think it is nice to see sometimes in the historic world that these long held notions can change. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's based on good research and good analysis. That's what does it. So I think it's, it's proof that nothing always stays the same in history. Right. It's a great point. It's a great point. Thank Su you. Super uh, fan Jody uh, from Savage, Maryland. Any closing thoughts? Was there anything on Pipe Creek or Maryland in general that we might've missed? <laughs> I know offline, Kent and I, we had a, a great conversation about the importance of Pipe Creek and a certain president. Oh, yeah. You want me to, I, I, let, me, let, me, just, let, me, let me throw that anecdote out before yeah, we- Yeah, since we're, we've been talking about it in your, in your wrap up here, we might as well just close with that. Who, who else would want to close with Ike, right? Yeah, with Ike, good old Ike. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, ha I have this friend, uh, who years ago told me that um, he was a friend of Frederick Klein, who um, was from Westminster, um, longtime Carroll County resident, wrote a lot of works on the Civil War in Carroll County and in Westminster. And um, uh, Fred Klein called him up one day and told him he's going to have a visitor come by. And he wondered if um, he would like to come over and join him. Now, my friend was my age. This is in the 1950s. And um, um, <clears throat> he said, no, I got to cut my parents' lawn. I, I, I can't do that today. And he says, uh, uh, well, he says, I'll tell you all about it after I get through with, my, uh, with, with this friend. So um, some days passed and uh, Fred Klein called up this friend of mine and said, uh, well, we really missed you. You would have really enjoyed being with us. And he says, well, who was your guest? He said it was uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Now I'll tell you, can you imagine missing <laughs> out on that? Yeah. And he walked, he walked Ike uh, along the south bank of Pike Creek. 
Now, you know, we're at Union Mills. That's a really steep bluff there. That's it big. sure is. And, um, and as you get, as you walk toward Middleburg, it, it lowers, it gets lower, but that's a steep bluff there. And um, uh, my friend asked him, he says, really, Eisenhower? He says, what did he say? What, I mean, what, you know, trying to get something out of, out of Fred that told him about the conversation. And Fred says, well, you know, in a nutshell, Ike told me, he says, you know, it's just daggone sad that, um, that Meade couldn't have defended hmm. the plea along Pipe Creek. He said, one, he would have won along Big Pipe Creek. But number two, the casualties would have been so much less. And um, he said, it's just sad that it had to be fought where it was fought. Mm. And uh, that kind of gives me goosebumps sometimes to think about. I mean, uh, uh, here's, here's Dwight Eisenhower um, saying that. But um, anyway, so I got Ike on my side. <laughs> <laughs> I can support in that big Pipe Creek plan, then there we go. There you go. There you, there go. you go. There you yeah, go. and if we have Dan Sickles on our side, I'm not sure that says about us. But. And it's a reason to always visit Maryland when everybody, somebody gives no. you that opportunity. You know, you know, my wife made an interesting comment not too long ago. We were sitting here in the kitchen, and, and the book had just come out. And she said, you know, I wonder whether more people now are going to visit Carroll County, Maryland. <laughs> I said, I'm sure there will. I'm they sure. should. What is this big pipe creek thing? Uh, and people are going to drive around and find it. Where, where is this piney creek? Uh, where is Meade's headquarters? I mean, it's, there's a marker there. But yeah. um, I imagine you're going to get some. I, I hope so. I do too. Can we go ahead and designate ourselves official pipe creek licensed battlefield? <laughs> 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 Carroll County Chamber of Commerce, if you're listening, give us a call. There you go. There you go. Welcome to Pipe Creek, where the battle wasn't fought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they, the, they wouldn't have been as hungry. They would have been closer to their food. And then <laughs> so, the, 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 the placard will be, come commiserate. <laughs> <laughs> Home of Pipe Creek and Superfan Jody. What else would Carroll County need? <laughs> that's right. That's right. There you go. That's right. Well, guys, well thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming on, and we will hold you open to that commitment to come yeah. back and, and finish right. the story. So thank you very right. much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.